the mic is okay. Okay, fine. Forever you will be. Forever you will be. The Lamb upon the throne. The Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow my knees. I gladly bow my knees. To worship you, Lord. One more time. Forever you will be, forever you will be, the Lamb upon the throne, the Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow my knee, I gladly bow my knee. Worship you, Lord. Lord Jesus, take all the glory. You are greater than any explanation any human being can try to give. The only way to really know you is through revelation. So, we ask that you reveal yourself this morning. Reveal yourself in the hearts of everybody present here. Lord Jesus, please, it is very important that you reveal yourself. Let them know you from inside. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we've prayed. Good morning, everyone. You are welcome again. How time flies. October is almost gone. And the year is virtually over. I can't believe it, but that's how it is. So we are continuing this morning our study on the Gospels, what is the Gospel, which we started August last year. And August this year, we came down to Pentecost. We are still on Pentecost. I've handled all that. And then, I've been saying or trying to say that Pentecost was the beginning of the calling out of a new generation of human beings who will become children of God from all races of the world. And then as I prayed, the Lord was impressing on me that there are terms, if you like, doctrines that we are so familiar with, but we don't really understand. And that is why many of us are not benefiting from our faith as God intended. And that there are in those terminologies or doctrines, blessings. So we, we hear glory, glory. We hear redemption. We hear salvation. And we assume that we know but then, when you look at our lives, they fall short of what God in scriptures intended in those 
terminologies. So I began to pray because we are not running seminars. We have two hours for our meetings and we have to eat food, we have to praise, we have to pray and have maybe 45 minutes to teach. So little by little he began to explain to me how I can manage this in the time available practically. And last meeting when I tried to introduce this aspect of our study, I gave the video clip about the president of Taylor's, Martin Greenfield. And I repeated, we've just repeated that again this morning, for the benefit of those who didn't come to last meeting, and also to refresh our minds. This morning we are going to try to make progress. The invitations that we send around, something is there that says, your work matters to God. Your work matters to God. And the import of the video clip on Martin Greenfield is his work. Is his work. And his work, incidentally, is so if you like, ordinary. I said last time, I said, what was it? A tailor. A tailor. If I may say, just a tailor. If I may say, ordinary tailor. But then, Martin Greenfield is a tailor with a difference. Martin Greenfield is a Jew. That's what we are going to look at today. Martin Greenfield, because he is a Jew, of course, the world generally hated them. They still do. And I'm not too sure, I'm not too sure, but The world also is gradually changing their attitude to Christians. We are beginning to be hated. It hasn't quite come to Nigeria, if I may say so, but even if it is happening, it is being, they are pretending. But in places like Europe, America, it is becoming dangerous to be a Christian. But before I go that far, in the envelopes you receive, there's a tract. Check the envelopes, the offering envelopes. You see a tract. I want us to deal with that tract together. As an aspect of your work matters to God. I told us last meeting that as I grew up, I thought that poverty was my enemy. So I aspired to be rich. And there's nothing basically wrong with that. And there are people today who also do the same. But What happened is that when I was saved, I'll come to that later, what does it mean that one is saved? When I was saved, and they began to teach me the gospel, and I began to study for myself because I had a lot of doubts. I had had so many things, I had read so many books, So, 
I wanted to find out. For example, the first time I was healed, my wife was born again five years before me, so she understood spiritual things much better than I did. And I, I was... So in the full gospel, the Lord healed me of power. But I doubted it. I told my wife, I don't want to be bamboozled. I want to be sure. And I lost the healing. I lost the healing. And when the pain came back again, I had to beg to be healed. And I thank God he, he forgave me. So these were little, little ways I was growing spiritually. And then he made me in particular to realize that I shouldn't pursue money the way I used to. And then the understanding he gave me, which I want you to also share if you like, was this. I used to sin to make money. I used to sin to make money. Number one sin, I was a thief. A privileged thief. You know, some people steal billions now. I don't envy them, but I didn't steal billions. I stole sp- I some millions with pen. And Baba said, no more. And it made sense. It made sense because I was understanding salvation in a practical way. So my understanding was if I was sinning to make money when I was a nominal Christian, I was sinning to fly first class, sinning to buy good cars. And then if I should continue to sin, to make money after I became born again. What did Jesus save me from? That was my understanding. So I said it to him. I said, I agreed. And I reasoned that if truly he saved me, forgave me my sins, then he should be able to provide for me in a different way without sinning. Does that logic make sense? Does it not make sense? Uh Aha. So I said no to corruption. But I didn't know how else to do business as a contractor in Nigeria. You've heard my story before. So I chose to to study. My family read this book. And we began to understand. My first two years was on Jesus. Within my first six months to one year, I knew a lot about Jesus. So I was confident with the little I knew that he could provide for me. I'm not making it look easy. No, no, no. Because we became poor. Hunger came. You know, those my big men friends, when I was living there, they said, who's up? One of them said, Uzo, bring the Bible, I'll go keep them for you. I'll give you six months. We're hungry, catch you. You'll come back. So, hunger came. Among those that God sent my way to disciple me was one professor, Duru Adeboye. He's an evangelist. He's a retired professor in zoology from ADU. One day, by the grace of God, I hope I can bring him here. Yeah, he's very busy. Then he, when he interacted with me, he said, how can two people be so much alike? He said, there's somebody I'm going to introduce you to. He's an architect. So he introduced me to architect Shego Kuti. Some people here in Kidion's or, yeah, Gideon's, would know him. So, 
Shegu Kuti took over from Prof and started teaching me. And Shegu Kuti would keep records of little, little things. And that is how this tract came. This tract was part of daily bread. And Shegu Kuti cut it out and gave me. I would like somebody to take the mic and read because this tract has been in your envelopes over and over. If someone can just quickly take the mic and read the tract. Quickly. Yeah. That mic is not on. Okay. I think it's on now. She wants to read. A holy calling. A, ho- a holy calling. As the Lord has called it, so let us walk. First Corinthians seven seventeen. The life of a Christian must not be divided into secular and sacred. Any task or vocation within the will of God becomes a holy calling to be accomplished for his glory. W.B. Gilson liked to tell the story of a cobbler who lived in Edinburgh. Okay. A cobbler, of course, we talk of, we say shoemaker, but the actual, the proper name is cobbler. People who repair shoes, okay? So that's another ordinary worker. Like Martin Greenfield was just a tailor, so that's a cobbler. Carry on. One day, the newly installed minister of the shoemaker's church made first call at the shoe shop. As the pastor taught, he used some lofty theological language. The cobbler replied with understanding and deep spiritual insight that left the preacher astonished. You should not be cobbling shoes, he said. A man with such thoughts and such a manner of expressing those thoughts should not be doing secular work. The cobbler was quick to reply, Sir, take that back. Take what back as the preacher that I am doing secular work, responded the shoemaker. Do you see that pair of shoes? They belong to Widow Smith's son. Her husband died last, last summer. She is supported by her boy who keeps a roof over their heads by walking out of the Bad weather is coming. The Lord said to me, Will you call me to speak to the Lord? So he won't catch cold and come down sick this winter. And I said, I will. Now you preach sounds under God's direction, I trust. And I will cobble that boy's shoes under God's direction. One day, when the rewards are given out, he will say to you and to me the same sentence. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Whatever your work, Christian, if it is noble and good, perform it faithfully. It is a holy calling. Amen. Is that clear? Yes. Now, just to summarize, a shoemaker, a cobbler, in a certain place, there was a new pastor, parish pastor, posted to his parish, to his area. And the parish pastor was visiting some of the church members and visited the shoemaker in his shop. And he was using big English, big theological terms to address the shoemaker. And the shoemaker was responding with understanding. And the pastor said, a person with your kind of understanding shouldn't be doing secular work, ordinary work. And the shoemaker said, no, take that back. He said, take what back? That I'm doing ordinary work. That I'm doing secular work. He said, why? He said, well, you are a pastor. And I believe that you preach under divine guidance. I'm a shoemaker. And I also work under divine guidance. The particular pair of shoes I'm handling belongs to a member of our church, 
a widow whose husband died not too long ago. And their young son is the breadwinner. And winter is coming. So I collected the young son's shoes so that I can mend them very well to enable him to walk through the winter without catching cold. And that I believe that walk, this shoe I'm doing for that boy, I'm doing it under God's guidance. Do you agree? I told us last meeting in your outline about Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, saying to the United Nations last September that a revolution is happening in the world concerning Israel. Countries that never used to consider Israel are now coming to Israel because of their cutting-edge technology in every area of life. In every area of life. And I also in your outline, last meeting I shared with you, by the way, the outline, I printed only 40 copies today because we are using the same outline today, November, December. So the 40 copies are for those who didn't come last meeting. So if you didn't come last meeting, please just show your hand. They will give you one. Okay? So in that, again, I showed one post that was on WhatsApp going around. Something that was at the gate or entrance of a university in South Africa that you don't need to use atomic weapons, bomb, to pull down a nation. That what you need to do if you want to destroy a nation is just to lower the standard of education. Because Buildings will collapse under the engineers produced through such wishy-washy education. Patients will die under the hands of doctors produced by such educational system. Bridges will collapse and so on. Families will suffer. And I asked us, do we know a country like that? Do you know any country like that? Where is that country? Niger. So now I come to today's teaching. Martin Greenfield, the tailor, He's a Jew. He's 86. Well, at the time that recording was done, he was 86. I haven't checked. By now, he's more than 86. By the way, two books are coming, his biography. By next meeting, they'll be here. His own full story. But the point for today is this. Martin Greenfield is a Jew. And Jews all over the world are serious people. They take everything they do seriously. They excel. Their population in the world is... But their control over world economy is big and they are quiet they are a people who there is a sense of destiny about them there is something peculiar about them that is why Martin Greenfield 
Hitler, the Nazis, arrested all of them in Europe. Martin Greenfield's family was arrested. Father, mother, brothers. Taken to concentration camp. They were separated. He didn't see his parents again. They were burnt alive. Including his four-year-old brother. He was the only one that survived. In that video clip, he tells us that he was raised by his father to, to be rugged, to face life. He said by 10, he became a man. I don't know how we raise our children today, but he survived the Holocaust. They put him among tellers he asked them, just show me how to make a collar. From there, he took interest in tailoring. When they were liberated by the Americans, he was allowed to emigrate to USA. That's how, by then, he had perfected how to make three-piece suits. He asked his employer, He said, President Eisenhower came and liberated us from the concentration camp. I would like to make him a three-piece suit. He saved my life. Now, his boss, an American, probably had never had any reason to want to meet the president of the country. But he pestered him. The man had to find a way to get that information to the president. And the president asked to see him. And the president remembered him. Remembered his face the day they were released from concentration camp. And he told him, I would like to make you a three-piece suit. And he made the first three-piece suit President Eisenhower ever wore. Americans don't wear, well, they normally didn't wear three-piece suits. Europeans did. He said, from that day till President Eisenhower died, all his suits were three-piece, and he was the one that made it. He eventually bought over that company. That is, that company where they employed him, is the company he developed that you saw in the video clip. And he has been the tailor of American presidents and other presidents, at least up to President Obama. A tailor. So, why am I emphasizing all this? Follow me now. He is a Jew. What is a Jew? What is a Jew? I want us to pray before I go into this. Just bow your heads. I want to pray. Lord Jesus, you are the one who was, who is, and who is to come. You are the one that all the prophets from Genesis to Malachi wrote about. You are the one all the apostles wrote about. You are the one who gathered us here this morning. Help me to reveal you the way you've not been known before, that solid decisions will be made in people's hearts after this meeting to follow you 
and to bring glory to their to themselves through you irrespective of their circumstances do that for us this morning in Jesus name I pray Amen. I'm going to take some time very quickly the story of Abraham when you read Genesis the story of Isaac the story of Jacob when you read them in Genesis are stories of ordinary people like you and me ordinary people stories of people who in their walk with God they failed and God would pick them up and continue with them he's he's doing the same with me I'm sure he's doing the same with you as we look at what we are going to look at now take courage he has not come to condemn anybody he sent a savior he will save you in every situation now my first scripture is Genesis 29 verse 35 Jacob was given a wife that he didn't bargain for the beautiful wife he wanted was the younger person. Genesis 29.35 That wife that was not loved, Leah, was having children. Rachel, the loved one, did not have initially. The fourth child of Rachel is the story in 29.35. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. She said, this time I will praise the Lord the Lord. She named the first, second, third Reuben, Simeon. I can't remember the third one. Sorry? Levi. Okay. All of them hoping to win the approval of her husband. But this one, this time, I will praise the Lord. Say the same thing. No matter what you are facing, say in this circumstance, this time, I will praise the Lord. Say it, say it, mean it. Let me tell you why I'm doing this. Let me tell you why I'm doing this. Why I'm doing this is this. This is just a woman in her natural human circumstances saying something to God but that thing she said is the destiny following Martin Greenfield that thing she said is the destiny following Israel today follow me Judah, the fourth son. The word Jew is from just the pronunciation of Judah. That's where that name that now represents every Israelite came from. But 
When God made his promise to Abraham, he said, you'll be a great nation. I'll bless you, and you'll be a blessing. And through you, all nations in the world will be blessed. And he said, through Isaac, this covenant I'm making with you will be reckoned. Isaac gave birth to Esau and Jacob. But for no reason, God loved Jacob and hated Esau. We leave that one. Jacob is the person we are dealing with now. Jacob was a supplanter. Jacob was a conny-conny person. Jacob was the husband of this Leah. Jacob was the father of this boy that Leah named Judah. Jacob, when he was coming back from Ur of the Chaldeans returning, had to wrestle with God. And God changed his name to Israel. All that you find, find in Genesis. And the nation was named after Jacob as Israel. Are you following me? The whole country was named after Jacob as Israel. That's why the country still bears Israel today. Then how come the citizens of this Israel are called Jews? They are called Jews after this man, after this boy. Yet this boy is not the first son of Jacob. Genesis 29, sorry, 49. Genesis 49. I read from verse 1. I'm reading from verse 1 because of sin. Because of sin. I'm hoping by the grace of God that somebody will take a decision against him, not minding the cost. Because the blood of Jesus that was shed for us was for this purpose, to forgive our sins and give us power to live above sin. But we act the way we act in Nigeria so that Monday to Saturday, no effect because we don't fear sin. We don't understand how dangerous sin can be. Genesis 49.1 Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father, Israel. Verse 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor excelling in power turbulent as the waters you will no longer excel for you went up onto your father's bed onto my coach and defiled it what was that? sin verse 5 Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. 
For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Anger, murder, what is that? Sin. So you see how the first three boys, who disqualified them? They disqualified themselves. They disqualified themselves. Now, see how the blessing came to Judah. Judah among, among all the children, as Jacob was making his pronouncement, Judah was the first to be blessed. Judah, your brothers will praise you. What did the mother say? Judah, what? Your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Say amen. Amen. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion who who crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Until he comes, Shiloh comes to whom it belongs. And the obedience of the nations is his. Listen to me. In this blessing, the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham that through you all nations of of the world will be blessed was given to Judah. Now, the country continued and continues to be called Israel. Judah lived his life as an individual, but his lineage and territory, the portion of land given to them, included Jerusalem. Included, God was at work. The first king saw was a Benjamite. But here, God has said, until Shiloh comes. What I'm trying to say here. My main message this morning sin. Sin. Can rob you, can rob future generations. Righteousness can bless you. And bless what? Generations. Generations. This is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. The point is this. Saul messed up. kingship came to David. 
David is from Judah. David is from where? Judah. I want you to take note here of this verses 10 and 11. Let me go back to the beginning of Judah, verse 9. I want you to take note that God described Judah as a lion. Lion is the male lion. Okay? Lioness is the female lion. And people who deal with lions know that lionesses are more fierce than the male ones because they are very jealous of their cubs. So you, they are more fierce and God used if I may say the tribe of lions both male and female to describe Judah. Eventually, just to round up for today, the kingship came to David. David ruled over Israel. David was successful. David pleased God. Not that David never sinned. I hope you know that. But I want to land. My plane, my plane don't reach Lagos. It don't reach Canal Estate. Eh? My plane don't reach Canal Estate. So I want to land. I want to land. This may surprise you. Revelation chapter 5. Verse 5. I've shared, I've used this before when we were upstairs. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. When I read it, I want you to tell me who this scripture is talking about. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. Who is that? What does that tell you? The promise made to Judah. The promise made to Judah, the blessing put on Judah was fulfilled in who? Do you see why I'm pained that the believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob under the old covenant are shining? And the believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob under a better new covenant are doing exam marriage practices, are underrating themselves. Do you remember the story I told about this scripture in my family? Who can remember about this Revelation 5 5? Let me see. Is there time? There's no time. But I'll just. Forever you will be. Forever you will be. The Lamb upon the throne. The Lamb upon the throne, I gladly bow my knees. I gladly bow my knees to worship you, Lord. 
I don't know. Am I connecting something today? Now, that chorus I shared with us when we were upstairs sometime. In 2007, September, August, September, our last daughter was on long vacation in New York after her first semester. Somehow, I didn't get money to pay the school fees for the second semester that was to start first week in September. God had moved in mysterious ways for first semester. I had shared that before. And then, second semester, and they had given us a letter, given us a date last weekend in August that if we didn't pay, they would delist a kene. They would deregister her. She will no longer be a student and she will return to Nigeria. And I said to God, how would you just... So a kene will spend only one semester and return to Nigeria. I ran from pillar to post. I did everything. The money didn't come. The last day that I could, if I had it, send something at least, was a Thursday. And nothing came. And I came back home that day very depressed. In my house at that time, we were hosting a redeemed church. So Thursdays, is faith clinic. When they were preaching, I hated having the church in my house that day because everything the preacher was saying, of course I didn't join, I was in the bedroom. Everything, I was just saying, this is what I've been preaching and now Ekene will come back. You can be saying it to other people, now Ekene will come back. I've been preaching these things and then in the night, in my sleep, I didn't realize initially it was a dream. I was hearing a beautiful choir. Forever you will be. Forever. The, music, the, the choir was good. So I joined in the singing. Then I felt pressure to wee wee. So I opened my eyes and said, oh, so now I dream. I went into the bathroom and I was humming the chorus and then the Holy Spirit just came and said, that scripture is from Revelation 5.5. 5. Go and check it. Oh, I didn't know it was from Revelation 5.5. 5. So when I finished, I went downstairs to my study no nepa. I used my phone. I opened to Revelation 5.5 5, and I read that scripture. When I read it, I said, so? He didn't. And he said, go back to verse 1. So I went back to verse 1 and I read from verse 1 because of time. Then I saw in the right hand of him who is on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Verse 5. Then, one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. 
encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, and so on. When I read verse 5 a second time, the Holy Spirit said, take note. It says, has triumphed, not will triumph. So I looked at it. I said, yes, so has triumphed. Then the Holy Spirit took over. He said, I'm not the one with withholding your finances. I just want you to note that in this situation, the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. Oh, I just say, Daddy, thank you. So it means this matter is out of my hands. So I started praising him. I rejoiced. It was around 3, 3 a.m. Later in the morning, I was excited. Around 6, I went upstairs to my wife. She too, of course, naturally was. She went to bed very ha- unhappy. So I said, let us pray. She said, pray now. She, she didn't even feel strong enough to get up to pray. After all, we, not, we never prayed before. We've been praying, yet money no come. She didn't know what I had encountered downstairs. So I started praying. I started declaring on the lion of the tribe of Judah. I started making pronouncements. My wife got charged. She got up from bed. And you know Mrs. Daniel, when she's charged, she's charged. She joined me. The long and short of it. After praying that morning, we were, we were very encouraged. We were confident. Faith is being sure of what you hoped for. Certain of what you do not see. So later that day, around noon, I went to the cyber cafe just to correspond with Ekene. And there was an email from Ekene. The email said, Daddy, when I woke up this morning, I had an urge to fast on this last day. So I will fast. What did she mean by this last day? That was the last day if nothing happened. Well, a Kenego packing bag returned to Nigeria. I replied, I said, you are in the spirit. See what the Lord gave. Revelation 5.5. 5. So as you fast, stand on it that the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. So I sent the email. I waited for some time. She replied. So I returned home. That was Friday. Saturday, I went back to the cyber cafe. There was an email from Ekene. Daddy, towards the close of day, yesterday, I got an email from the university with an attachment. I was afraid, but I, I said, the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. So I opened the email. I opened the attachment. And the attachment said, print out this letter, bring it on resumption, you will be admitted. Print out this letter, bring it on the day of resumption, you will be admitted. So the day of resumption next week, first week in September, she took the print out, gave it to them. Everything she needed for second semester was given to her. Room. She got to her room. She entered kept her things. It was like dream. She put on her computer, tuition account, ran through it. She was owing $16,200, which was the school fees for the semester. And New York Institute of Technology said, high-level private university, they don't play with school fees. She they owe. And they've given her everything. She took her ID card, went to the CAF, cafeteria, flashed it at the door, door open. She ate. 
and your ID card if you are owing. No go open door. The door open. She did everything she needed to do. She came back to her room. She was like, is this real? She put on the computer again. Just to check. She checked. Her eyes just went down to where she saw the bottom. She saw 2,200. Uh-uh. She looked up. There was a credit, $14,000. By whom? Till today. We don't know who credited the $14,000. Till today, we don't know. Am I communicating? It doesn't, in your situation, it doesn't always have to be that dramatic, but I have linked you from Judah to Jesus so that you can understand your salvation. So that when I come to now teach the doctrine of redemption and salvation, God willing, it will be clearer to you. God bless you. Now, are you going to say a prayer for yourself? A prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, I didn't know that you had blessed me from Judah. I didn't know that you had blessed me from Judah. I didn't know. Pray that prayer for yourself, for your husband, for your wife for your children, for the generations that will come through you. This blessing, do you know where it's coming from and it reached you? Pray that through you it will continue in your generations. Pray that you will not toy with sin and lose this blessing. Judah had three senior brothers. Pray that this morning will be a turning point in your life. The understanding you gained from this teaching will be a turning point in everything you do. Pray that you will live in power. Jesus Christ said, you will receive power. You will live in power as a shoemaker, as a tailor, as an engineer, as anything. Pray that you will excel. That through you, people will praise God. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Pray that praise will come to God through your life. That the blood of Jesus shed for you will not be in vain. You will bring glory to his name. Round up your prayer now. Round up your prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Now if you are here, you are not born again. I don't care your religion. You are not born again. This blessing is not yours. But this blessing is available to you if you receive Jesus. He is the only one who can give you this blessing. So you are not born again and you are here. Please just raise your hand. I've exceeded the time I intended. I want to pray for you. Anybody? Someone invited you? You are not born again? Anybody like that? Nobody. Okay. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.
If you want to clap, clap for Jesus. It's not for me. Praise the Lord. Offering time. We call our brother. Chumobo.